All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about vaccines, but first I want to First, I want to thank the uh, CBB for inviting me and Murray Moo Young for all the help that he's given me over the decades. Uh, I mean, I think he doesn't quite remember, but I actually first met him uh, when I was a postdoc at Western in about 74 or 5, something like that. And I. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> and um, I was working with the. Uh, engineering department there uh, with a fellow named Jim Zayats who also had a lot to do with establishing biotechnology and teaching a lot of biochemical engineers in Canada. So I think we first met then just briefly but then later on I guess while I was at Connaught and maybe a few other times I came and gave some adjunct professor meaning free lectures <laughs> uh, here. So uh, it's been a long association and a good one. So I'm happy to be happy to be back to visit you. So, anyways, let's talk about vaccines for a minute. Um, I want to make sure at the outset that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, so, first of all, you know, the purpose of a vaccine is to teach your immune system something so that it will protect you from a disease later on. It's not a cure; it's a prevention. And in the history of mankind, vaccines have saved more lives and reduced illness more than any other kind of pharmaceutical intervention of all kinds that you could think of. So they're highly effective and really our world has changed completely because of them. Um, on my parents' farm in New Hampshire, there's a small graveyard that's a little bit smaller than this room and in it there's 36 graves and about 25 of those are children under two and they most probably all died of vaccine preventable diseases and all the dates on these gravestones are from the late 1800s to the early 1900s before vaccines came into common use and that's what used to happen you would try to have 10 children and three of them would live not nice so those things are gone. The one that's, that's, that's totally gone is smallpox, and there's a cattle disease that's been eliminated through vaccination called Rinderpest. But tetanus, diphtheria, polio, pertussis, which is whooping cough, uh, haemophilus, which you don't know about but you're protected against, uh, pneumonia, measles, in spite of all the nonsense lately, and a long list of other ones, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, flu, all these things are much, much reduced. Much reduced means 99% of what it was, say, in 1950. That's a huge difference in human productivity, human lives, quality of life, all kinds of things. And some of these diseases, like measles, um, can cause lifelong difficulties with hearing or with vision, and the measles, mumps, rubella combination vaccine, rubella also causes a lot of these things. Those three combined have done more to reduce blindness and deafness in the population than practically anything else. So these are very, very important and in spite of the stuff you might hear on the news or on the wrong source on the internet, uh, the side effects are practically zero, we're talking about one in 10 to the five, one in 10 to the six, that kind of thing, for anything other than a small feeling of soreness at the injection point. So there's a lot of nonsense out there, but there's a lot of serious data over decades and decades that show these are the best preventive medical interventions that can be obtained. And you know, why is there a lot of discussion about vaccines? Why are they in the news all the time? Why do the anti-vaxxers exist? And there's this huge ecosystem surrounding vaccines. I mean, in certain sense, it should be a very simple intervention. You go to the doctor when you're, or you're taken to the doctor when you're two months old or four or six months old, and you get a shot. You should forget about it after that, you're done. You're protected for life, by and large. But over the years, a lot of people have gotten involved in this. 
I mean, you have governmental regulations on how they're made. You have government in public health trying to encourage people to do this because it's good for the population. You've got R&D of all kinds. You've got social factors. You've got religious beliefs. And in fact, to the best of my understanding, there really aren't any religious beliefs that prevent this. There might be religious individuals that say it's a bad idea, but not written down beliefs. You've got family structure, and it makes a big difference to family structure worldwide. Uh, if you look at the developing world, the vaccines were introduced a little bit later than here, but the effect has been one-to-one. -one. You vaccinate a population, and the number of children per family goes down. The available resources per family, therefore, goes up. The only problem is maybe you don't have as much, many people working in the field, but half of the children that were born before died and couldn't work in the field anyhow. So everyone benefits. The whole social structure is improved by vaccination. Uh, you've got universities like this one teaching people about all this stuff. Uh, you have industries producing these products, so that employs a lot of people and creates other interesting problems like need for a large amount of investment and then a need for profit on the investment. And you've got the whole medical community that obviously is concerned with disease and the reduction of disease and the treatment of disease. And they themselves have their own set of beliefs and ongoing practices and so on. And so the way you see it as a person or the way you will see it if you have children is that there is a standardized immunization schedule in every country. Canada included, that says, you know, at this age, you take these vaccines. At that age, some others. A lot of them are centered around uh, two, four, six months or 12 months. Uh, measles, for instance, waits longer. Um, but the whole culture revolves to some extent or is involved to some extent in the way vaccines are used. And that's why it's a complicated discussion. And that's why you see it in the news so often. If you look at it from a business perspective, um, vaccines are a small fraction of the total pharmaceutical business, but they're an important fraction. And uh, traditionally, and it's, it's really tradition that has led to this, vaccines are priced very low. For the benefit delivered, the cost is very small. And Sometimes that makes a big problem industrially. How do you balance the large investment to get a new vaccine on the market against a kind of small return later on? And that has had a big effect on the number of kinds of vaccines that are available. There's about 20 odd vaccines currently available worldwide. There could be a lot more except for this balance between investment and profit because of the uh, perceived population perceived requirement for low prices for vaccines. You don't like paying $1,000 for a vaccine, but in the course of a year, you might pay $1,000 for a heart drug. And, uh, and the benefits of the heart drug are maybe, and the vaccine is definite. So if you look at it just in terms of the vaccine market, right now this, it's about 16 billion, something like that. And uh, that's a lot of money, no question about it. And there are some main vaccines that are making the money. The DTP that everyone gets as a child, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, doesn't make much money. Um, pneumococcal vaccine makes quite a bit. Some of these other more recent vaccines make more money. So generally, the, um, generally the newer the vaccine, the higher the price right now. But um, that's just the way life has to be. So. What's a vaccine? And uh, the answer is it's a very small amount, which is all you need, all your immune system needs, of an antigen, which is a piece of the infectious organism that's about to bite you. And so uh, sometimes that's a protein, sometimes it's a polysaccharide, sometimes it's a mixture of things, or a peptidoglycan, or something really complicated. Um, sometimes it's been genetically engineered to have just the right parts in it that excite your immune system in the right protective way. And it's, it's really hard actually to find which of the, you know, 15,000 proteins, the bacteria that's about to infect you makes, which one of those, if your immune system knows about it, will make antibodies that will protect you against that organism when it finally comes. So it's a long, complicated sequence of events. And as you make a new vaccine, you've got to figure out 
the answer to that question, which of all these 15,000 proteins is the one I want to make as the protective antigen that will make the antibodies that will protect you. So it's basically an alert, and you've got two kinds of memory. One, the kind of memory I hope you're using right now, and the other one, uh, a chemical memory for molecules that get into your bloodstream that are not made by you. And so your immune system is in constant surveillance from the moment you're not quite born, um, looking for what's in this organism. And it, in a, in a chemical, biochemical, cellular sense, remembers all your proteins and all your polysaccharides and other parts of you. And it never attacks them. Sometimes it makes a mistake and that causes certain kinds of disease. Something strange gets into the organism to you as a baby, it says, this isn't something I've seen before, I'm going to do something about it. And it tries to get rid of it. So here's, I mean, another answer to the question, what's a vaccine? Okay, so that's a vaccine uh, containing diphtheria, tetanus, and um, a variety of pertussis vaccine that I used to make at, at Wyeth Letterly in, in New York City. And so that's an example, and we made you know, millions and millions of doses of this kind of vaccine and sent it all over the world. And overall, both at Connaught that Murray mentioned and at Wyeth in, uh, in New York, um, and at another company that worked at as well, the total is probably about three and a half or four billion doses of vaccine that have gone out while I've been responsible for manufacturing at these companies. So that affects a lot of people. You need three or four doses per person, so that's a billion people. So in terms of what happens next, okay, doctor walks up to the baby, injects some stuff into it, and what do you get? Uh, a response. And there's two kinds of responses. One that's useful, which is this one. Uh, the antigen gets exposed to B cells and T cells, which are part of your immune system and floating around in your blood, white blood cells. Um, the other thing is you get a wound response because the needle just went into you. And that usually is the cause of the red mark and, and soreness at the point of injection. Often after you get a vaccine, you get a fever. And that's a natural response of your immune system saying, I found something new, I'm gonna do something about it. And your T cells, um, which we'll talk about in a second, work better at a couple of degrees higher than normal body temperature. So your body becomes pyrogenic, makes yourself warmer, so your T cells will work better so you can develop a better response. So there's nothing wrong with that response. It's your body saying, ha, I found something new. That means the vaccine's working. So if you look at the B cells, um, in a certain sense, they're simpler. Your body makes about 10 to the 10 different B cells every day by a really neat combinatorial mechanism that was discovered by uh, my postdoc advisor after I left Western, Niels Yerna. And um, he asked a simple question. If you can make 10 to the 10 different antibodies a day, do you have 10 to the 10 genes that make that many antibodies, and of course you couldn't fit it into your genome if you did. So he and his colleagues, um, Susumo Tanagawa in particular, um, discovered that you have a combinatorial chemistry system in your genes that make antibodies that take VDJ units in the, in the genes that make the antibody and combine them randomly and that gives you about 10 to the 10 different antibodies that you make every single day. And what happens is the antibody sticks on the, on the B cell, and if it encounters the antigen that happens to fit into it, so it's a perfect one-to-one -one match, lock and key mechanism, then the B cell divides, makes more of itself, maybe goes two, th two or three rounds of division, and then it starts producing some antibody, and then it hangs around to see if this stuff shows up anymore. And that's why you've got a second dose of your vaccine. So two weeks later, you go back to the doctor's office with your now you know, four-month-old child, and she gets another shot, and now these eight or 16 or 32 cells that are specific now for that one antigen each see it again, and they become 32. So now you've got 32 squared cells 
that are specifically designed to make antibodies for that antigen swimming around in your system and they go into a kind of a resting state and they protect you for the rest of your life. That's pretty cool. The other way it works is there's T cells that also have a similar mechanism but it doesn't make an antibody that's a soluble protein molecule and they target themselves at killing something. So they will recognize, multiply in the same sort of way but they don't make a soluble component. And when they bump into the pathogen or they bump into a cancer cell that maybe you made yourself, even though, and it looks different than the rest of you, um, they go on to it and they have special molecules that look like a grommet and they put it in the membrane of the offending cell and its contents leak out and it dies. So it's not really a toxin, it's almost a mechanical injury in that sense. So that's how they work. So you get both of these activated and made specific for the antigens that were in the vaccine. And so at the end of it, you've got antibodies floating around in your blood every day for tetanus, but you haven't stepped on a nail yet. 20 years later, you step on a nail, you get tetanus in your foot, organism starts to grow, antibodies stick onto it, the cells that are there multiply and make more of themselves, make more antibodies. And what the antibodies do is they completely coat the pathogen. So the antibody is a Y-shaped molecule. It sticks on to the offending object. And the back end of it signals your macrophages to kill the offending object. And kill means engulf and put it in a little uh, lysosome inside the cell and pump in a bunch of proteolytic enzymes, hydrogen peroxide, stuff like this, oxidize and take it apart. Oxidize and hydrolyze. So that's what a vaccine is. And so, you know, as engineers, someone, I hope, will end up asking you someday, like several people in the back row there, um, help me make a vaccine. So, you know, what do you have to do to make a vaccine? I mean, first, as I said, you gotta find that right antigen. Secondly, these days, the most likely thing to do is you'll find the gene for it, you'll clone it into some appropriate cell, and then you can begin to make a lot of it. Once it's in the cell, and you can do it in a microtiter plate at a tenth of a milliliter, you're gonna need a little bit more than that. So you've gotta scale it up. So we'll talk about scale up in a minute. Once you've got it scaled up, you're gonna grow it in a bioreactor. So you've learned all about that in your biochemical engineering course, I hope, and how to scale them up. And I mean, one quick note is almost nobody in this business does what they're told to do in their biochemical engineering course. And they should, because it actually works. And people get into all kinds of trouble and waste literally hundreds of millions of dollars because they didn't do what Murray told them to do in his book, <laughs> okay? Um, at that point, you can make your antigen. You gotta do a whole bunch of tests. You gotta purify it. You gotta make it right. You can do it in clinical trials and see, does this make antibodies in people that neutralize the offending organism? Sometimes it doesn't. So you gotta start all over again. So in our project that we're at right now, we're just at that interface of beginning clinical trials. Then you have to make it. And we've had a number over the history of the different companies I've been with, we've had a number of products that worked, protected against disease, and we couldn't make them at a price that was affordable by anybody. So they went down the drain, which is too bad because it means there's still diseases out there that no one can be protected from. So you have to figure out, and that's an engineer's job, by and large, is how do you make this stuff in large quantity at low cost? I mean, that's classic engineering, chemical engineer's job. In parallel with all this, you have to get approval from Health Canada in this country, FDA in the US, CFDA in China, wherever you are, and uh, that is a combination of answering questions about how did you make this? Is it pure? Is it the same every single time? Is it effective? Does it actually do what you say it's gonna do? Those are the basic concepts of regulatory. We'll talk about that some more. Then you've gotta have medical acceptance and social acceptance, and a good example of a failure at that late point was about 10 years ago, there was a disease, there's a disease called Lyme disease, which is carried by ticks, and it's a bacterial disease. The bacteria is similar to syphilis in a certain way. And two companies went ahead and tried to make a vaccine for this. One of them got it on the market. 
could not get social acceptance because of the anti-vaccine movement and they didn't have sales and the company took it off the market. So for a short few years, people could get protection from Lyme disease, which is a debilitating, horrible disease. And now you can't anymore because of failure at social acceptance level. So there's lots of ways something can fail. Anyways, then you can eliminate the, the disease. And as I said, some of them have been mostly eliminated. The only human disease that's gone is smallpox. So it's a long and expensive and tiresome process and you have to be really patient and you have to be on your toes and run like hell all that time. 10 years, $100 million minimum. Uh, the last brand new vaccine that I put out that was um, in widespread use cost us $800 million in 10 years, but we made it back in a year and a half. So it's not that bad. Okay, but you have to be patient. So if you want to make it, here's the quick diagram. So you need some kind of cell line, you need some kind of antigen that's embedded in that cell line genetically, and you need some kind of process, and that's easy, right? So let's take a look at all this stuff. Uh, the thing you don't want to do is what is still done for flu and for measles, some flu and some measles around the world, is people thought for a long time before they had good bioreactors that they could use a fertilized chicken egg. Here's a nice source of cells. They're pretty much sterile. They've got their own immune system. Uh, the heart is beating. It's not bad, right? A bunch of cells. Um, but, you know, where did it come from? Think about where it came from really hard, okay? And it's just plain old technology, and just as well, you would not make a new electronic device with one of these if you guys even recognize that, an electron tube, um, you wouldn't make a new vaccine starting with eggs. Unfortunately, some people still do, and it leads to a plethora of problems that they thought they were avoiding at the beginning, but wrong. So instead, you want to use the best technology, so you want to have a nice automated bioreactor like what we have in Montreal there. And if you do that and do everything right, then you end up with a vaccine like this one that we just finished making in Montreal and use that, that vial and that lot for animal testing. So the whole idea is you want to have today's best technology. It's going to take you years and years to implement it. By the time it's in full-scale production, that technology, the best of today, will be kind of old. So you have to think really hard about the lifetime of this Vaccines don't go away. I mean, electronic products live for three years or something like that. Vaccines, tetanus is not made a whole lot different, some significant improvements, but fundamentally the same product as was made in 1950. So these are long live products. They take a long time to develop, but they have a long, long product lifetime. So it's different from other things. So, you know, now that we understand all this stuff, you've got to put it all together and make a process and get a product out the door. And you've got to use all the available technologies that you've got to do that right. So when it comes to production is where a lot of things happen. And many, many potentially perfectly good vaccines have failed to go from the shake flask or the microfuge or this little tiny column scale on the lab bench to full-scale production. And it is exactly this problem that applies to you guys, because that's your job, is to get it from here to big. And it's not easy, um, and there's some very good reasons for this. So, you know, if you've studied physics at all, you probably know the name Richard Feynman, who he figured out the, the way uh, nucleons are arranged inside the nucleus and quarks and all of this kind of stuff, uh, electro-nuclear dynamics. And he has this really nice statement. He says, it's not true that if you build an apparatus and then build another one with every part made exactly the same, of the same kind of stuff but twice as big, that it will work in exactly the same way. And that's just as much a law of physics as F equals MA. 
Okay, you can't scale up an atom to the size of an apple is the way I like to say it. And you can't. And the reason the profession of engineering exists is to get over this problem. So you have to find a way at larger scale to do what worked at small scale. And that means you've got to really think about it. And all those engineering correlation equations that you have for showing what to do as you scale up, measurements of KLA, measurements of oxygen transfer and mixing and all the rest of these things, all those things that they teach you are there to overcome this physical law. And unfortunately, I don't think many people hear about this physical law in high school when they should have, <laughs> okay? But I keep repeating it whenever I can. So it's really, really important and it's really, really true. And whether it's you can't make a mouse into an elephant and keep the same body proportions, it's the same problem. He'd break his legs in a second. So um, it's the same problem, but in 16 different ways. So the way you overcome that is you use all your engineering correlation equations and you figure out the data you need that applies to your situation. And if you have to do experiments to measure the data you need, you do that. And the place you do that is in a process development lab. So this is not much bigger in scale than something you would do at the university. But instead of just, you know, can I make it work? Can I make it work about the same three times in a row and publish a paper? I mean, that's a good model for university life. Here we do things hundreds of times and get it so that we get the same result to within decimal points every single time. And we make all the physical measurements about, say, these bioreactors, oxygen transfer rate, mixing rate, shear rate, all the stuff that you guys are taught about. And we take that very seriously so that we know exactly what's going on in this reactor. And mixing is a complex, three-dimensional, time-dependent, viscosity-dependent activity. And it's a mess. But if you haven't characterized it at 10 liters, it sure isn't going to work at 3,500 liters. So that's what we do in a process development lab, is not just kind of make it work better and then give it to somebody else. You figure out all of the numerical parameters that you have to so that you can calculate, using the best engineering, how it will work bigger. And that's your starting point bigger, and you'll still have to fiddle it a little bit because all nothing works perfectly, but you're 90% of the way there if you do it this way. You're not there at all if you don't. So that's a big difference. So that's really important. So in order to go into manufacturing, uh, you need a facility that meets, I said FDA, but that applies to Health Canada, and it's pretty much worldwide standards right now, whether you're in Korea or China or India or Europe or here or South America, it doesn't matter. And the reason for these facility requirements have to do with the long history of lousy products coming out. Things that were contaminated is the biggest problem, and the biggest source of contamination has tended to be air and water. Sounds easy, right? Clean air, clean water, easy. Huge problem, not easy. Um, you have to have equipment that does what it's purported to do. If you say you've got a 3,500 liter reactor and it's gonna operate at 37.2 degrees and stay that way for three weeks, you gotta prove it. And you gotta prove it if the city water pressure changes, you gotta prove it if the room temperature changes, you gotta prove it if the airflow rate changes, because that's removing heat. All kinds of stuff can happen. What if the electrical power supply has a wiggle in it? Does that change the temperature? You gotta study all these possible effects on the temperature of your great big reactor to make sure it actually does what you say it does. So that's what validation is. You need people that don't do stupid stuff. And doing stupid stuff is doing anything other than what was planned, basically. You have to be smart. You have to be watching. It's, it's a complete wrong point of view that manufacturing is routine and rote and that anybody with a third grade education can do it. Wrong. You need people like you to do manufacturing who understand what's going on, watch, see what's happening. If something different happens, you recognize it and you think about it and you do something about it. So the old fashioned idea of manufacturing be is run by untrained people with very little education, maybe even not even the right language, doesn't work anymore. Completely wrong. So we only have, in, in the most recent example in Korea, I hired 
350 kids your age or master's degree, and they ran the whole plant, and they're running it today now. So we had no, in quotes, lower level employees. And that's because you have to really understand this is really complicated stuff. Okay, and you need some money, you need some time if you're gonna do this. So here's just, I'll give you some quick pictures. So here's the factory that we built in Korea. So this was originally built, there was a vaccine being developed for HIV by a company in California called, and the, the product was called AIDSVAX. And it looked really, really good in the clinical trials and very early clinical trials. So I was involved in that and a buddy of mine from a long time before was involved in that and he was Korean. And he found an investor in Korea that said he would put up $200 million to build this factory so we could make the AIDS vaccine. That's nice. So I went over there to be president of this thing and we built it from, I mean, it's an amazing project in the sense that the land you are looking at was not there the first time I went to look at it. Okay, well, they filled in 200 square kilometers of coastal mud flats and made land and we were the first commercial purchaser of land. There was one government building down the road over this direction. So we bought this land, about 50 acres in our system, and put up this factory, and um, about $100 million into the project, the AIDS vaccine failed in its pivotal clinical trial in Thailand. So, oops, <laughs> but, but what we had done, and. Luckily, the Korean investor listened to me when I said this. I said, look, that might happen. Vaccine could fail. So we do not specifically design this factory for that one product. And that's, I think, a major lesson for you guys, too, is that I've seen too many times I call, an call in an engineering company to do something, and they want highly specific data about the process, and they build precisely to that data. And the process never works that way, and we're fixing things and changing things all the time because of it, and it's the wrong approach. So instead I said, okay, how much is it going to cost to build a general purpose plant that will do this kind of thing, plus or minus a big margin, and it was about 10% more. He said, fine, it's only $20 million, forget it, just do it. So we did it. That allowed us to find a company in the United States that uh, had a product that they thought was going to fail in the clinical trial and they put no resources into preparing for manufacturing and they desperately now needed to make a product that passed their clinical trial. So they came to us and we had a gap of maybe five or six months while we figured this out. We started working with them and we made their product here. And um, this is the scale-up train of, uh, this is just the scale-up fermenters, not the production fermenters. So it starts uh, 20, 100, 500, 2,500 liters. And in animal cells, because they like to have a higher cell density, because they make growth factors that affect each other, and they won't grow very well if they're too dilute, that's a good sequence. So we did exactly five-fold sequence, four production lines, and you can sort of see the diagram over on the other side, and put this all in. And then this provides, you know, one of these bioreactors provides the inoculum to the production bioreactors that were 15,000 liters each. And uh, this the Swiss company, Bioengineering, made these things. They worked perfectly from the day we bought them. But we had to go through all the validation and all the documentation and all the preparation of standard operating proce procedures, SOPs, so that we could get the people to use them and make it reproducible. But the first run that we did, all the way up to this scale, mammalian cell culture making a recombinant protein worked, and we got the same yield as they had gotten in the lab scale three years before at this company because we had done all the engineering. Most people fail at the first time. We didn't. So do your engineering. Anyways, after it's grown, so here you've got, um, you know, in the bioreactor, you've got between 12,500 and 15,000 liters of cells and about two grams per liter of, of the antibody that we were making, like, it was like an antibody. And there were four of these bioreactors in a square, 
And the way we arranged the production schedule was every four days we started one of the little bioreactors, and that meant eventually every four days we harvested one of these. So we were able to centrifuge it. So this is a large continuous flow centrifuge. This would harvest the you know, nominal 15,000 liters in two or three hours. And then after that, um, it was put through some filters, um, a depth filter and then a 0.2 micron filter for sterility and stored in a large vessel that you can just barely see the top of up there. And we were able to centrifuge it and clarify it and then go on and purify it. So some of you have probably done chromatography, but on little chrome, uh, columns like the one I showed you earlier, this is a 1.6 meter diameter column and um, the absorption resin in there cost $3 million and was good for 100 batches. And we had to change it several times because of that. But big stuff. And then uh, this is a computerized valving system that controls the flow of all the different fluids through there. So you control, you know, you wash it, you clean it, you restore it to its original condition, you put the right buffer in it to accept the new molecule, you put it in, it absorbs, you change the buffer to desorb it and collect it, and then you have to go through the cycle over again. So this thing does it pretty much automatically. And the way we arranged this facility was we had four bays like this. So we had um, four unit processes, one in each bay. But even though it was extremely heavy equipment, you could move it around if you had to change the order for some other product. And that was part of the engineering that made this plant flexible. So, and then at each station there was a holding tank, an estimate of the volume that you would have at that station. So that worked perfectly, and so we were able with this system to purify uh, each run in three days and have one day to turn it around and be ready for the next one. And the last 100 runs gave within 100 grams so about five kilograms of final product per run within a plus or minus 100 grams every single time, okay? And that's the object of manufacturing, this high reproducibility. So, you know, you have to think about that if you ever get into a manufacturing type job, you've gotta have reproducibility. And there's this wonderful study done by Intel that I teach all our people about called Copy Exactly. And that's a really good series of articles that they wrote and a mechanism that they installed at Intel to get high reproducibility in their manufacturing processes. It applies to everything. It's really, really good. Anyways, at our facility here in Montreal, um, this facility uh, was built in about 1997 by a small company from Holland with a lot of Canadian government money and support. And it was set up to be what's called a contract manufacturing organization, CMO. And the idea is that for small biotech companies and even for big pharmaceutical companies now, it's much more efficient for society as a whole to have one company that does manufacturing and maybe another company or multiple companies that make new products. And then the fixed asset cost of the manufacturing is shared among many products. If you are just making one little product and maybe it'll work, maybe you can sell it, and you spend $100 million or 200 like we did um, on a factory and you have nothing to make in it, then this is a big waste. So um, it's better to share. So that was the concept originally on this building. And um, the trouble was that company, after a few years, was bought by a bigger company that was bought by a bigger company. And by the time the bigger company owned it, they didn't even know what this was about. I mean, this was 0.001% of their budget, and it was poorly managed, and it had all kinds of problems. So eventually, it went out of business. And the building was bought by another big drug company, and they thought that they were gonna move people from Washington, D.C. into Montreal, and everyone in Washington, D.C. said, uh, we don't speak that language, and it makes snow up there, and we're not doing that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so they didn't. And the building sat empty for seven years until my wife and I retired. So she's of the same ilk and in the same business. Um, 
And our son, who's a chemical engineer like you guys, uh, got an ad from a realtor that said this was for sale. So we drove up to Montreal from Kingston and walked through it and bought it. <laughs> I mean, faster than you would buy a car, actually. <laughs> what else are you going to do? Or retirement's boring. <laughs> so um, in order to run it, we needed some more money. So we got some investment from a Chinese company uh, to give us the money to operate it as a CMO. And so this is some of the equipment that's in there. This is one of the 700 liter mammalian cell bioreactors. Um, here's a 3,500 liter uh, microbial cell bioreactor. And this, di this picture shows pretty nicely. This is, uh, it's totally automated operation. It's totally automated cleaning. So these are the holding tanks for the cleaning fluids. Every single pipe here gets cleaned automatically according to a PLC cycle. Um, this is where the growth media is made. This is used as a surge tank for purification, but everything is sterilizable. Everything meets government requirements for pharmaceuticals. Uh, here's a small control panel for running the seed bioreactor, and then that's the production bioreactor. And this is on the lower level, and uh, here's a similar centrifuge as the one I showed you before, but a little bit smaller, and some other purification equipment. And, you know, from your perspective, this is sort of an interesting antique. Uh, it's really kind of the end of electromechanical controls and the beginning of computer controls. So there were really sophisticated PID control modules in there and a lot of direct wiring controlling every single one of the more or less 500 valves in here. But it worked really, really well. And the only thing it didn't do was it didn't report to an outside computer. So we went back to the company that made uh, some of these uh, little PLC controllers, uh, uh, PID controllers, and they made a module that just connects them directly to a modern computer system. So we, now we can get all the data out and we can do control, set point control backwards. So we renovated this whole thing. We took it totally apart, changed every joint in a plane, changed every O-ring and gasket and checked everything and repaired some errors that had uh, crept into it through bad maintenance. And it's fully operational now. And the, to put things on scale, if you went and bought this set of equipment from the same manufacturer today, it would cost us more than we spent on the entire building. And there's four similar systems in the building. So plus the utilities, plus everything else. We also, on the utilities, um, as I said before, clean air, clean water are really important. So there's 22 air systems in this building. So we cleaned out every single one of those, replaced all the filters, replaced all the motors with variable speed controlled high efficiency motors to reduce the electrical bill, um, fixed up the water system throughout, and now the air systems and the water systems and the production systems all meet regulatory requirements. So it's been a little bit of a project. So, you know, when it comes to making healthcare products, uh, everyone talks about regulations. And, I mean, number one, they're not something to be afraid of. They're not a mystery. They're very, very carefully designed and they make good sense and they make good science. And a lot of people sort of viscerally react, you know, you're not telling me to do that. That's ridiculous. Well, that's usually wrong, and almost always wrong. And they're never, in spite of the fact that some people get themselves into a thinking loop where they do something that's ridiculous, saying that they're following a regulation, if you really study it and you really look into it, they're not actually following the regulation. So that's an important thing to think about because there's lots of regulations in this world, but certainly in the drug business, which has extremely complicated regulations, if you go back to the basics and you really read the law and you really understand what they're talking about, you do not get into ridiculous situations. I've just never done that. I've seen people do stupid th stuff, but it's not necessary. So anyways, the most important thing about the regulations, you know, is the product the same every single time? Has it got contaminants in it of some kind, anything, oil, dust from the air, some bad raw material? Um, is it out of control? Okay, do you get the same thing every time or do you get different numbers all the time? And are you controlling the right thing? Or maybe you're not controlling the right thing. So 
you have to think about the long-term effect of manufacturing something where you're going to do hundreds and hundreds of runs and you want to have a standard deviation that's a few percentage points. Not easy. Not easy at all. But that's fundamentally what the regulations have to do. So how do you do that is, number one, you document everything. And you not only document it, you read it and think about it. Number two, you validate it. You prove something happens the way you, says, you say. So that whether it's a piece of equipment maintaining temperature or a long complicated process that has manual interventions, is it really doing what you said every single time? Those are the fundamental things. And in answering the questions that come up, you know, do I really know this or do I just think it? That's a really important first question. Because a lot of times we say, oh, you know, it always works like this. And then you start thinking about it and say, oh, really? Maybe not. So, uh, you know, did it do what I thought it did or did it do something else? Did I write down what I started with and what I ended up with? You can't imagine how many people don't do that. And did I change anything intentionally, inadvertently? Who knows? I mean, we had an example in the U.S. We changed O-ring suppliers, little rubber O-ring. The second supplier was cheaper, and that's why it was changed, and it slipped under the radar. The reason it was cheaper, that the rubber, instead of being cured with a platinum catalyst, was cured with a sulfur catalyst, and sulfur came out of it and killed everything, and we lost $100 million for the product. Okay? <laughs> so there are big mistakes that you don't want to make. Um, and, you know, was the product really the same as last time, or do I just think it was? So these are all really important questions. So here's our system here. As I said, each one of these colored areas has a different air system. They're all purified air to various extents. Uh, the highest purity is in this room and this room and these two rooms and uh, these rooms over here. But there are standards, international standards for that and we meet them all. Uh, here's just some more of the equipment and it's all been validated now. Um, and as I said, you need people who are smart and well-educated and who are thinking on their own, not just doing what they're told, and who want to be there and who want to make this product, because the moment somebody doesn't want to do it, they're not going to do a good job. So this was the first batch of one of our vaccines, and he's probably holding a million dollars worth of product right there, okay? <laughs> Thus the smile. The other thing is raw material testing. And at least some of you should know this story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And if you read this thing here, I purchased it once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt, which I knew from my experiments to be the last ingredient required. Uh, and late one accursed night, I compounded the elements, watched them boil and smoke together in the glass. And when the ebullition had subsided with a strong glow of courage, I drank off the potion. And that's what turned him from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Later on, he ran out of that stuff, and he couldn't get the same one, and he was really stuck. And it's a real problem, not so bad today as it was even 10 years ago, but you got to check your raw materials every time. Which lot number? Have I tested this lot before? No. I go out and I test it and make sure it really is what it says it is because sometimes you find there's some other stuff in there or it's not even the same stuff at all, and you're sunk. So, you know, this was a long time ago when this story was written. People knew it then, it's still true today, and it's very true. So, um, you know, just to kind of finish off, the, the other thing that's important in these products is the quantity of stuff in a vaccine is micrograms, millionths of a gram, maybe 10 of them, not 100 of them. And so what you're really paying for when you buy the vaccine is not something per gram. You're paying for the cumulative information that's behind that small quantity of material that proves it's what it's supposed to be. So, I mean, it's your baby, you're going to put 10 micrograms of tetanus vaccine into her. You really want to make sure that that 10 micrograms that you can't even sense because it's so small uh, is really the right stuff. So the way you do that is through the regulatory system. Health Canada has approved it. It's made by a recognized manufacturer. 
Um, you don't buy the cheapest stuff on the market. You make sure it's within the date ranges for its stability. All these kinds of things. And behind that little 10 micrograms of stuff, if it was paper, would be 50 cubic meters of paper of information showing exactly where it came from, what it was made, every single raw material, the tests on every single raw material, and all of the tests on it and everything about its filling and packaging and distribution and shipping and temperature regime and everything. So that's what you're paying for when you buy 10 micrograms of vaccine, not 10 micrograms of stuff. So you gotta think about the value of information and you know that from computer software, you know that from lots of other aspects of life. But this just happens to be a chemical where, yeah, the chemical is really important, but you're not going to use it without the information. And so that's really important. So I'm just going to give you, do I have another couple of minutes? A couple of examples of what vaccines do. So um, Canadian scientists at NRC in Ottawa, Harry Jennings, developed a method for making a vaccine for Haemophilus, which I'm sure you've never heard of. But it's a bacteria that lives in the nose. And with a small baby, it can easily break into the membranes around the brain and infect the brain. And in eight hours, and there's three diseases that have this identical characteristic, it kills the surface of the brain. So the next morning, you've got a baby that can't do this and can't talk and will never walk, but might live for 25 years. Nasty, seriously nasty. So people have been trying to make, <coughs> excuse me, a vaccine for this for a long time and Harry Jennings figured out how. And the way he did it was to connect an outer polysaccharide on the organism with a protein that you make good immunity to. Polysaccharide doesn't work in a baby, a baby doesn't respond to it. The protein was practically irrelevant to the disease but the combination woke up your immune system and you got both B and T cells working. Then it protected the baby. So we made the first one of those at Connaught Labs in Toronto. And it was introduced here. And you can see what happened to the disease. And now that vaccine is used, not just that one, but made by several different manufacturers, several slightly different manufacturing techniques. But the basic concept from Harry Jennings is the same. Protein coupled to a polysaccharide just about gets rid of it. So on a worldwide basis, there's practically no more Hib disease, and there's certainly no Hib disease in anyone who's been immunized. Big difference. So instead of lots and lots of kids with brain damage, they're perfectly fine today. The second disease of exactly the same nature, same mode of operation with respect to what you see in a child, is streptococcus pneumonia. You commonly think of it as pneumonia, and you think of it as an adult, as a chest disease. It does the same thing to the baby, exactly the same way. <clears throat> and we made the very first vaccine of that nature uh, at Wyeth in New York uh, and launched it just, just exactly Christmas of the year 2000, uh, Christmas of the year 1999. And same story, boom. And also what happened was adults stopped getting the disease from the children. That's nice. So um, big, big difference. And now that product is used in the developed world, but it's still too expensive for the developing world. So that's still a big problem. There's still, you know, the children of the bottom, probably two billion people in the world, don't have access to this because of the high cost of the vaccine. It's the most complicated vaccine ever made. This organism evades your immune system by changing, it has a polysaccharide outer coat that protects it in a long, complicated way from your immune system. And there's genetic mutants of it. Each mutant is fairly stable, but there's 100 different mutants. So you get pneumonia from one of them and become immune, ah, there's 99 more to get you. So this vaccine now has 13 components that protect you against about 90% of possible actual cases that happen, depending on the distribution of these different types. Um, and that's used, as I say, throughout the developed world, but very low penetration into the developing world. And in the developing world, pneumonia kills 25% of all children who die under two. 
So that's a big problem, and that's what we're working on at NUVAX, is to make a vaccine at a price point that's appropriate for that population. I'm not even going to try with the rest of the population. The third one, and there's, again, multiple varieties, but meningitis C does the same kind of thing. Uh, the UK was having an epidemic of this, and the Minister of Health in the UK just put up an alarm. He said, any drug company that can come up with this stuff, we will buy it, we'll pay whatever price you want, just make the vaccine, we'll help you get it licensed in the UK, just do it, we will pay, we'll get it on the market. So three companies tried to do this, and the first one was us at uh, Wyeth in New York. And I mean, we had a lot ex of experience, we knew how to make Hib, we knew how to make the pneumonia vaccine, we made this one, two years, boom, from the guy that, time this guy put up his hand. And um, it just turned an epidemic into no more cases. I think two years after it was introduced, there were zero cases in the UK. Amazing. And this disease affects not just little children, but high school age and college age kids. So I will bet that all of you had a meningitis vaccine before they let you into college. Is that required here? Good chance. And, uh, or it should be. If it isn't, it should be. Anyways, um, a lot of schools require that because it affects people at your age. And it's devastating. You don't wake up one morning, but you're not dead, and you can't do anything. Nasty. So there's a second version of this disease. Um, oh, I didn't maybe include it. Yeah, here. Um, where meningitis A, not C. This affected this, this belt right along sub-Saharan Africa all the way across. Total epidemic. Uh, a friend of mine in India who was head of vaccine manufacturing at this Indian vaccine company got money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and several other international organizations. They followed the same procedure we had used for the meningitis C, basically, and again, in a very short time, produced a meningitis A vaccine that reduced the cases to zero. That's a big difference. And in their case, it sold at a few dollars a dose. So that's, that was a really good outcome. Um, just another thing that we're doing that I thought you'd be interested in is in uh, last November, I was asked by the WHO to come to Geneva and they were having a big meeting about how, do we, how, do we gonna, how are we going to make vaccines and antibodies for the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. So these countries in Africa, as I'm sure you saw on the news, were having a big Ebola epidemic, which has kind of subsided now, which is interesting because it, the actual epidemic followed the epidemiological mathematical models very, very closely. So it means people know how to model these things pretty well. So it's, it's going away now, but still, what are we gonna do about these things? Vaccines and antibodies. So we did a big production planning scenario and tried to figure out who could make what and what things are possible to be made. And the Canadian government, in fact, um, played a major role in this in that we have a level four containment laboratory in Winnipeg that made both a potential vaccine and potential antibodies to treat Ebola. And they did it several years ago. Nobody had the money or the desire or whatever to push it forward but it was at a stage where that could be done. So the vaccine got licensed out to be made at a company in the United States. Uh, we ended up making part of the uh, cocktail of several different antibodies that you need for antibody treatment. Uh, the same gene was also put in the, into tobacco plants in the United States to make antibodies in tobacco plants, and that also worked. So we've just made some, some batches of that uh, antibody to treat Ebola. And so I'm just going to show you, I mean, we did it at a fairly small scale, so a nominal 100 liters, um, and we set it up quite quickly once we had the cell line from the government. And here we are doing the purification. So we've done two batches now, not a lot of doses, but probably enough for one or 200 people, something in that range. So, um, you know, if you're set up and if you know how to do this kind of stuff, you can respond to an emergency situation. So there it is. 
So anyways, that's what I wanted to say. And if you've got any questions, ask. Well, yeah, okay, can I, am I optimistic or pessimistic about trends in manufacturing? Yes. And uh, there's three things that I know about that make me optimistic. And if you're in manufacturing, you've got to be optimistic, because otherwise nothing would ever come out the door, right? But, um, I mean, companies like ours are taking things that have you know, in the last decade had moved offshore to India, to China, to other places, and saying, ah, you know, look, we're smart enough, we've got better computer technology, we've got better educated people, we can do it here. Two other really good examples, my nephew, um, who just got a chemical engineering degree at Stanford, uh, is now working for SpaceX, okay? They have a huge manufacturing facility for rockets, in LA and they did the same thing they bought an enormous airplane hangar from Lockheed Martin and they're making rockets in it right beside it is a completely automated machining facility that makes parts both for SpaceX and for Tesla Tesla's made in the US so you know if you're gonna operate at the top of the intellectual heap I'm very optimistic If you're gonna try to do something that doesn't require that it's going to be cheaper and easier and better to do it in South America or China or someplace else. So that's the opportunity, you know, our style of education system gives us. And I mean, the other distinct difference in our style of education from what I saw in Korea, for instance, I had really smart kids. I mean, sorry, kids. <laughs> and, um, and they'd gotten good grades and they were really good at school but they had not been taught how to solve problems or how to think outside the box, as we would say it. But after about a year and a half, we had taught them how to do that, okay? But most companies over there maybe wouldn't have done that. So other people in other parts of the world are plenty smart, and we've, you know, you want to stay ahead of the pack, you've got to stay ahead of the pack, and most of it's here. Ah, so I, th I think the question is, I'll summarize it. How many products do we need to be successful in a vaccine company? Uh, the, the one, the market and the product that we have chosen was both chosen, were both chosen very, very carefully so that we could just do one thing to get going. So by targeting this unfulfilled market for pneumonia vaccine in the developing world, there's lots of people by accident, not planning, that facility is designed bigger than you would ever make it for that product. So we can make lots of product and that reduces the unit cost. So I think we're gonna be fine with one for now. And to do two, um, we don't have the capacity or the finances to do two at once. In the long run, sure. But you know, it's this old story, you know, get started on something, do one thing and do it really well. So that's the strategy. Right now, either large North American or European companies supply into that market, or medium or small companies in India or China, not China, not so much, it only supplies itself right now, but other countries, um, operate in a low price environment. The way the big companies can do it is if you've already made 10 million of something, making an extra 2 million has a fairly small marginal cost. So they recover the marginal cost, and that works for them. Um, but they couldn't make the first 2 million doses at that price. It has to be the last. Companies that do it in other countries where labor is l cheaper tend to do two things. One, they hire cheaper labor, and in most countries now, people with a really good education get paid almost the same everywhere around the world. So they're hiring people with less education that they're paying very low wages to, but they can live on it because that's the nature of the country. But that means the intellectual input is smaller, so the complexity of the process is less, so they're depending on, you know, essentially brute force to get it through. 
So um, that's the source of the vaccines. The way they get distributed is they are purchased by an organization called Gavi, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And Canada, for instance, recently gave them $200 million for this purpose. And countries around the world and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other individuals have given a lot of money into this fund. It pays for the vaccine and then the vaccine is distributed by UNICEF. And your pennies that you collected on Halloween, I hope, went to UNICEF for the same purpose. So um, that's how, it, and then it arrives in the receiving country, usually for free. And then it's a debate as to how, who is responsible for distribution in the receiving country. So that's how it happens now. In this way, most kids get some vaccines around the world. Not all, not all kids get all vaccines, but most kids get some. Well, I think I'm going to summarize it in one simple way, asking open-ended questions and accepting the answer you get. If you have a defined answer for all your questions, multiple choice test, for instance, then people either in a given year or historically, and we all know how that happens, uh, will learn to the test. But if, I mean, in a school environment, if you're asking totally open-ended questions, how would you make a process for making, you know, chlorophyll? Right? If you've learned enough biochemistry and chemical engineering and blah, blah, all kinds of stuff, then you'll figure out some answer to that. And in answering it, you will show off all that you know and you will have selected the information that's relevant to that problem. And so, you know, one question might be, why can't, except that I know part of the answer having been <laughs> in that position, you know, how would you make 10 tons per year of, and give everybody a different of? Okay? That would eliminate the kind of extra effort that goes into figuring out what was on last year's test. <laughs> okay, but it would increase the teaching lo teacher's load in correcting the test. So that's one way to think about it. And the other is to, I mean, just, you know, what's, I mean, it all revolves around that kind of a problem. Uh, in the Korean system, the question and the answer were extremely well defined. There were an enormous number of questions and answers, but it was a known set. So then how do you think of outside that set? Not easy. So, and it doesn't just depend on, for you guys, on the teacher, do it yourself. And I'm not sure that video games is the answer, but it might have something to do with it. But again, even in the video game, it's a combinatorial problem, and the set, however big it is, is still limited. So that means challenging yourself, you know. I mean, my approach to that was making rockets in my backyard, but in those days, no one got in trouble for doing that, <laughs> okay? One of your slides, uh, I think part of one of your slides, you had a very nice looking lounge with some very beautiful young ladies in a thing. Is there a story behind that? Because we think about a manufacturing facility which uh, people are always working. Yeah, so when we bought this building, um, it had been left over from DSM. They had abandoned it, as I said, seven years before. And the coffee room had a machine in it that you could put a quarter into and get a cup of coffee by some mechanism, probably powdered coffee. And so that went in the garbage, real quick. The walls were painted about the same color as the cement. <laughs> okay, the chairs were wire and extremely uncomfortable to sit on. This was a place designed to make people go back to work. So, um, and you know, all the employees, except for myself and my wife, are basically your age. 
not your age, but the rest of them. <laughs> and um, they said, this place is ugly and horrible and we don't like it. So I said, fix it. So I gave them my credit card and they went to Ikea and they fixed it. They bought all new furniture, they bought bean bags with a bean bag manufacturer right around the corner, they found him, went there, he made bean bags to fit and <laughs> the colors they wanted and they repainted the walls and they did it all themselves. I mean, we got a plumber to redo the plumbing, but um, so now it's, it's a fully equipped kitchen. You can make anything you want. There's an oven and a stove and there's a really top, top end espresso machine and we keep it full of coffee and we make sure there's always food for people. And we also took two offices and turned them into bedrooms because uh, cells don't know that it's 4.30. So you have to take a sample at midnight, you might as well take a nap. So we put all them, the bedrooms were also done the same way. So we made it a comfortable, nice environment. And uh, we've got the highest speed internet that you can obtain. So you can, as we have one of these in the, in the coffee area, and we have a company subscription to Netflix. Okay, you gotta stay late, you might as well watch a movie, that's fine. So um, people do. And it's, you know, you spend so much of your life at work, it should be nice. And we've tried to make it so. And I've, we don't have, I mean, we don't have detailed expense report issues. We, everyone can, if they need a chemical, they just put it on the credit card of the company and buy it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want it going through some central purchasing agent or any other such thing. So we've made life easy. We can keep track of it all. I mean, I gave my kids credit cards when they were 10 years old, so I didn't have to give them an allowance. I knew exactly what they were spending and where they were spending it. <laughs> and they never would have told me otherwise. <laughs> so these modern systems work fine and it works fine in running a company. And we passed our audits too, so nothing weird's going on. But uh, you know, that's the way I think you would like to have a company be. How many people do you employ and what, uh, what uh, degrees do they have or what disciplines do they have? Okay, so we got myself and my wife have PhDs, about half the people have masters and half have bachelor's degrees, all in, in chemical engineering or biology. And then we have a steady stream of terrific, put up your hands, interns, mostly from here actually, uh, who come. So we've got about 20 full-time employees and about 10 interns uh, every single, every semester, 10 more. <laughs> so there was another one here earlier, but he had to go do something else. And they've been terrific. They are terrific, no question about it. <laughs> so, you know, and where else? I mean, unfortunately not you guys, but the most recent batch walked in, we were just about to start making Ebola antibodies. So the first project doing this kind of stuff is let's make Ebola antibodies. That's cool. Change the law might be hard. The um, the only thing that's really needed, I mean, the regulations are actually kind of okay. I mean, everything can be tuned up, but they're basically not a big deal. Um, the thing that's difficult, if you make a new vaccine that's never been used before in Canada, and even if you get it approved by Health Canada, uh, you do not have it at that moment on the formulary list of each province. The formulary is the list of products the province healthcare system will pay for. And that takes some work. That's another kind of work, but it's not impossible. In terms of political influence, you know, really I don't think any is necessary. I mean, it's all fairly straightforward. You go through the regulatory process, you get it approved by Health Canada, you get it on the formulary, people will use it. The purchasing of vaccines in Canada is essentially a one purchaser, one time a year event. So if it's on the formulary, people are gonna use it, it's gonna get purchased. And it's a question of price. So it's, it's um, I mean, there's all kinds of politics that you hear about, the anti-vaccine movement, 
you know, you're not sticking my kid with another needle attitude, stuff like this, but that's, I'm going to say, the social side of, of politics, not the actual commercial side. Okay? What do you think is the next vaccine to come? Ooh. I, the, the one vaccine that has shown to be very useful around the world, and I don't know the statistics in Canada, but it's not used widely enough, is rotavirus. And rotavirus is a intestinal virus that basically wipes out the bacterial flora in your intestine and you get very bad diarrhea. Not so much of a problem for people our age, but for babies this can be lethal. And uh, there's been several vaccines around the world for that. A lot of it's used in more southerly countries. Uh, I don't know if it's used in Canada, but I think that's one where it is. there. Hmm? It, is. it is good. Thank you. But it's one that I think will be used more and more, and where I think improved versions of it will come out. In terms of something very different. I mean, there's work on uh, West Nile virus vaccine, and I worked on an experimental one of those some years ago. That's turned out to be less of a problem than people thought it would be when it first appeared. But we're definitely going to have vac uh, infectious diseases that are typically found in warmer climates eventually show up in Canada. And I mean, the simplest example that I've seen firsthand of that is in the early 80s, um, rabies spread from dogs and other animals, foxes, to raccoons in the southern United States. And every year, it moved north. And by the time we were ready for it in Canada, in walked the rabid raccoons. So diseases change. And we're seeing Chukunyunga virus from South America come into the southern United States now. We're seeing dengue virus also move north. So as things warm up, we're going to get southern diseases. And people are working on practically everything that you would think of. Uh, it's just a question of going through all of this stuff. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. Okay.